Today's show is brought to you by our patrons over at patreon.com slash animaniacast. Special thanks to Alex, Christian, Kyle, Marie, McCoy, MJ, Nebby, Kretzel, Sir Zeke, the Guaranteed Engine, the Cartoon Gamer, Weffy, Brian, Marjorie, Martin, Melissa, and Patrick. All these patrons are not only getting bonus audio with commentaries with Tom Ruger of every episode of Animaniacs, but they're also going to be getting some extra audio and video clips from today's interview with Maurice LaMarche. So head on over to patreon.com slash animaniacast for exclusive access to that and to support our podcast. And welcome everybody to a special anniversary episode of the Animaniacast. Animaniacs 406-859 take one. We know a remote farm in Lincolnshire where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. Do you really mean that? Uh, yeah, but if you could start a half second later. Don't you think you really want to say July over the snow? Isn't that the fun of it? I think it's so nice that you see a snow-covered field and say every July, peas grow there. Um. We're talking about them growing and she's picked them. Well, we want to be out of that snowy field. But I was out. We were onto a can of peas, a big dish of peas when I said in July. Oh, sorry. Yes, always. I'm always past that. You are? Yes. Um, can you emphasize a bit in, in July? Why, that doesn't make any sense. Sorry, there's no known way of saying an English sentence in which you begin a sentence within and emphasize it. Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July and I'll make cheese for you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of the Animaniacast. This is our fifth anniversary special. That's right. For the past five years, we've been talking about Animaniacs, as well as other shows in the Rugerverse, such as Tiny Toon Adventures, Freakazoid, and of course, Pinky and the Brain. I am Joey, and without further ado, can you please welcome back my co hosts? There's my brother, Nathan. Uh, that's General Nathan. <laughs> and <laughs> across the country in Georgia, there's Kelly. Hello. And joining us once again for our special anniversary show is the creator of Animaniacs himself. It's our friend, Tom Ruger. Hello, nurses. <laughs> and please welcome back to the Animaniacast. This is a man that's responsible for voicing cartoon characters throughout our childhoods and our adulthoods. He's worked on some of our favorite cartoons, such as The Real Ghostbusters, The Critic, Simpsons, and Futurama. And of course, on Animaniacs, you probably know him best as, well, I don't know, maybe the voice of the tortured artist Michelangelo. What have you done to my ceiling? <laughs> or the always positive Squit the Pigeon. Far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a good pet. <laughs> you were a good feather. You had it all. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's the megalomaniacal megalomaniacal. I can't even say it. The megalomaniacal Me- mouse. The megalomaniacal. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mouse. He says it better than you, Joey. I, I, crying out loud. I'm sorry, brain. It's the brain. It's of course. It's Maurice Lamarche. Yay! 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 I can never say it. I've tried so many times. You guys call me Mo, by the way. Every oh, day. Right. I can't stop them. It's never been my favorite name, but it's, it's growing on me somehow. <laughs> okay. Hi. Well, welcome, Mo, to the Animaniacast. Once again, of course, you were here a few uh, few years ago. We had you on for the Good Feathers reunion. The Good Feathers reunion. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't seen Chick. I'd seen John Mariano throughout throughout the years, but that was the first time I'd seen Chick Venera. And I think uh, the first time I was in Tom Ruger's new house. So... <laughs> It was nice to nice to be there. That was a, a we, fun afternoon, we and it was great to see Chick after all these years. Yeah, yes. Chicky. And of, and of course, Chick. right, we started our, our podcast five years ago. And, you know, you may not know this, Mo, but you, you were there for the very beginning. Because we, we oh, premiered so. on, I think it was Memorial Day weekend, and we went out to Phoenix Comic Con. And you and Jess were there for that right. weekend. And uh, so 
and and you were you're nice enough to to help do some a little uh stingers or bumpers or whatever you want to call that's them that's right that's for right for us <laughs> and uh i remember now it's all coming back it's there. all coming back well no so, i remember phoenix comic con very well it was a, a standout comic con in my just in my life and and uh yeah yeah no it's just uh, that was a great con and uh, i always feel like i'm robert wagner when i say that we're gonna take down a great con, baby. A great con. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never know what hit him, baby. You know, it, it takes a thief. Nineteen sixty, too long ago for you guys to remember. That's how long the reference is. But anyway, <laughs> Tom knows. Tom remembers it takes a thief. Oh yeah. Then there was the heart, heart versus heart, heart. I don't know. I think it was in that. Heart too. to heart. Heart yeah. to heart. Yes. I, I by then I'd left. I yeah. I left Robert Wagner. At, you know, but Lionel Stanner was on. Lionel Stanner. Lionel Stanner. <laughs> this is Jonathan I look after them because otherwise they'll get themselves freaking killed. When they <laughs> met, it was murder. That's right. <laughs> well, so yeah, so you've been here for the very beginning. Of course, my my, I gotta mention this our, for it is our fifth anniversary. I gotta thank I gotta thank Nathan and Kelly for coming along with us this entire time, helping me put together this podcast. And I think uh, it's all been Joey. <laughs> like, well. <laughs> That Joey is does not 99%, true. Ninety-nine percent, I feel like, and we, <laughs> he does all the editing, and then he does the, social media. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I couldn't even. And fathom. I can't even do my own Twitter. So <laughs> <laughs> the very definition of a, of following your passion, though, Joey. See, yeah, exactly. So this Joey's is got this it. is what comes of that. You've got this but, podcast, this great podcast. Although when Joey and, was getting uh, the 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 stingers from you, Mo, like. He had to have you re-record. <laughs> I remember um, right. this. Yeah. He was getting a phone call or something while you're doing <laughs> That's right. uh, That's Michelangelo. Right. You guys had to come back and, and yeah, line yeah, up like, again. Yeah. Could you, could you do could it again? Do this? Yep. I remember <laughs> it. You I remember really do. how great you did? Wow. I'm not just saying that. I absolutely remember that. <laughs> yeah. And I charged you twice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, this is, the, this is what happens. But, you know, thank you anyway. Uh, well, no. Uh, <laughs> And of course, Tom, you know, uh, you know, th- I think our really our, our show went to the next level when when Tom you know, suddenly messaged us and said, "Hey, you know, hey, I was wondering if I could be on your show sometime." And you yeah, just kind of talked like, about, it. and I was like, "Sure, anytime, come on on." And, and then when it was would gonna, you ever ask a person like <laughs> like why hadn't I was being so no, yet? <laughs> no, get that creep out of here. No, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's like we never even fathomed that anyone would. <laughs> yeah, like, who no would want to be on our show. podcast? But uh, that, I mean, that really took our podcast to the next level. And I mean, it made us like legitimate. And I think in a lot of ways, too. So thank you, Tom. Well, for... you've had a lot of uh, the principal people involved with. Yeah, uh, I think many cast. you've had Paul Rugg, you've had Randy, you've had Rob. Uh, I guess someday. Uh, have you had Jess? Arnett? I have not had Jess yet. Uh, or, we, we Jess or Tress. recorded his Comic-Con. So in yes. that sense. <laughs> Does that <laughs> count? Recording a panel? I don't think so. <laughs> well, there are many more people that probably uh, you should you know, have uh, yeah. participate. But you it's see. great to have Mo here today. Let's, Absolutely. let's make sure. Get all the Mo you can out of we all. Mo. We, yeah, got, think, we can have him for I think just much. saying that Tom Ruger's been on the show has helped us get all those other, like, uh, <laughs> other great people. Like, oh, well, Tom's I'm like, oh, okay, I guess it can't be that bad. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> tremendous, tremendous cred with him <laughs> as the guy who created the show. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get right into our discussion here with Mo. And I, I think first of all, we just got to go right to the the beginning here. And how did you mm-hmm. how how did you get started in voice acting? How did this career come to you? Um, from well, it sort of, I got there was there were like it's like I got a false start and then a real start. Um, this was something I never ever saw myself doing. Uh, I was told very early on it was a closed community. Even when I was a teenager in Toronto, my mom. Had a had a friend, a lifelong friend, who was one of the leading voiceover guys in Canada. His name was Nick Nichols, and uh, and he was he was he had several very big campaigns, and he also had some on camera work. And he did the new Avengers with Patrick McNee. And he and, and and anyway, he had on camera campaigns and voiceover campaigns, and he came over to. Um, he came. I'm gonna. I gotta kill this thing. Hang on one second. Okay. I'm getting. I'm getting the. I've got that citizen app that you know tells you like 
everything that's going on like a helicopter overhead. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> Vehicle collision at Sepulveda and Kester. Okay, that, that affects me. But anyway, um, so Nick, I remember he came over to our house, and I'd known him sporadically all my life. And of course, he had this—he had the Coffee Crisp candy bar campaign, and he had the Carling Red Cap Forever Association campaign. Any of your Canadians that are listening right now, I know Rob Paulson would know all these campaigns because he grew up in Detroit and got all the Canadian television over the border. But anyway, so Nick came over to our house and he was giving me the pep talk. You know, he saw something in me. He'd, come, he'd seen me at, uh, you know, doing the impressions in the living room and all that. And I was like, I think I was like 17, 18. And he gave me the pep talk uh, about taking my shot. Rocky had just come out. So wait, if Rocky came out, uh, yeah, I was, I was probably 18, 18 or 19. Um, and, you know, he gave me the pep talk about taking my shot. And it was kind of cool. To have a guy who was doing it tell me, you know, it's not like growing up in Los Angeles where, you know, you just go down the street and you've got three people who guest star and everything uh, on your block. You know, you meet, you meet, you know, every every supporting cast member walking their dog during the pandemic. You know, <laughs> Canada is a little more, a little more unusual. Um, so long and the short of it is, uh, I was, you know, I. Dove into stand-up comedy in in Toronto and was tapped by Nelvana Films. The talent coordinator from Nelvana Films was in the audience. They'd done one special that got a lot of attention, uh, and and they were they were doing their second one. It was called Easter Fever, and it was the roast of the Easter Bunny as he retired. <laughs> and I was I was 19 years old, and they saw me doing stand-up at Yuck Yucks Comedy Club, which was the first can, Canadian comedy club. And um, they said, with all your impressions, you could play all these characters on, on the dais. So I worked up. I played like five characters in this special where Garrett Morris was the, the voice of the Easter Bunny. So uh, he was, you know, fresh and, and you know coming in hot on Saturday Night Live. Uh, half the cast of Second City, John Candy was on it. Catherine wow. Harrow was on it. Wow. Uh, uh, Joe Flaherty was on it. Uh, and and. You know, we, uh, I mean, I, I did this thing and I, I just fell in love with the art form. I did their second special, which was called Take Me Up to the Ball Game. And uh, I had no impressions in that one, but I got to do kind of an original character. And, and then I promptly moved to Los Angeles. I was supposed to be in their feature called uh, Rock and Rule. And um, I was supposed to have a really big part, but when I moved to Los Angeles, um, they kind of recast because they had said they would fly me in and then they cast some kid named Howie Mandel in my part. I don't know. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, that was that. And I figured that was the end of the cartoons for me. But I'm going along nicely with the stand-up comedy, doing all right. And uh, Nina Nissenholz from the William Morris Agency, who represented me for stand-up and TV variety, was in the audience and she said the same thing. With all those impressions you do, you could do animation voiceover. And so she started sending me out and for like a year. I read for things and didn't get a single thing, but it didn't, it didn't play with my head because I had the comedy, I had the stand up, and I was, you know, just I'm glad to be like, I was going on the road with Rodney Dangerfield a lot and, and, you know, doing, doing, you know, middle act and headlining at clubs. And then finally one clicked and it was Inspector Gadget as the oh. chief. They were recasting because they were moving the show from Canada where Don Adams was doing a grocery store sitcom uh, back to the States. And so I um, I ended up uh, being the second guy to play Chief Quimby. And then uh, here's your assignment, Gadget. I thought that Walter Cronkite would be a fun voice because he looked very, you know, kind of crotchety in that big mustache. And, and then, and then uh, they started in production on cartoon version of the Ghostbusters movie and uh, Marsha Goodman, who had you know sort of been, been my sort of my my discoverer, uh, had me in to read for uh, Egon along with 382 other people. Huh. And I mean that the the waiting room I've never seen such a full waiting room. And uh, one thing that Michael Gross came out and said was, "Don't do the people from the movie. We have them; they're the executive producers of the movie, <laughs> and we, they don't want anybody imitating them." 
And I went, great, because I've been working on my Harold Ramis for two days. <laughs> I went into the booth, looked at the sketch, and nothing came to me. Nothing. I had no voice for him. I looked, I thought I tried a Poindexter voice for two seconds, kind of a, oh, uh, this could be extraordinarily bad for Slimer. And it just, I was like, no, 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 it's not going to work. And I went in and I just, I just did Ramus and went, well, I guess I, I screwed the pooch on this one, but I did my Ramus impressive. This could be extraordinarily dangerous for Slimer. And then, and then walked out and, you know, and Michael came up to me and said, you know, that's a, that's a very good Herald. I said, I, said, I know I said nobody can, can, can but you, I'm going to let you get away with it. And off I went. And uh, it was so strange because Ernie Hudson was in the waiting room to audition to play his own part. <laughs> and so was Arsenio Hall. Uh, and they were the only two African-American actors there when I was there. And Arsenio uh, looked at me and just said, you know, and, and, and it, which was mouthing, I'm mouthing. I don't know what the F I'm doing here. <laughs> and I, cause we knew each other from the comedy store and, uh, and, and I think it must be that Ernie got, got a film or something like that. Cause not to disparage the job our Ar- Arsenio did, but I just can't imagine not just handing the job to Ernie, but anyway, so we were off and running and we did 106 episodes. Of wow. And I was like, wow. So this is, this is this life. eh? you just, and- because yeah. I got offered a feature film in that period, and we were like six episodes in, and um, and uh, I got offered a million dollar movie, uh, which uh, which I don't know if you can remember that one, but it was it was uh, it was about a search for a million dollars, and it was supposed to be the new it was a Dino De Laurentiis picture, and it was supposed to be the new Wild 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 Mad 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 World, and um, and I was supposed to be a cop who did impressions. And my my manager actually said, "Let's pass on it because you, you're doing this show. We are it's you know seventy eight episodes guaranteed, and they'll they'll definitely recast you." So I stepped back from it, and they really wanted me so much so that they they like kept calling and upping the offer and upping the money. And and anyway, Kevin Pollock ended up doing it, and I think that kind of gave him a little momentum on his film career. <laughs> I think it was his very first film. Um, but I, I, I just carried on with the cartoons. I figured I love this life. You know, you come in, you sit, you read the words and a check shows up, you know, a week <laughs> later. And it's, you know, you know, much more than you'd make selling suits at Brooks Brothers. So but you also kind of what hit, I had been on track to do. You also hit it out of the park every time you read a, a word. So that, that, that makes the big, big difference. Ah, uh, yeah. Tom, you're kind to say that. That's very true. That's very, very kind of you. But I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, I, I mean, <laughs> like right now, I'm on an audition run of like I must have. I think I think I've read for fifty things since uh, since COVID, and I haven't I haven't knocked one out of the park yet. I I do a good audition, but I haven't I I haven't been booked. Uh, it's a very you know we uh, we have you- little dry spells. Do you have a, a several shows currently? I know you're doing Animaniacs, Pinky in the Brain, and but your uh, Futurama is that done? Or, or I mean, there are other shows that you're. Re- oh, of regular- course, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm in I'm in Disenchantment right now, right. and we are wrapping up um, uh, the fourth the fourth uh, uh, chapter, as it were, because there are there are um, or fourth volume with ten chapters each. So we just did we just ADR the very last one. And we're waiting to hear on that. I'm I'm very lucky. I'm I'm sort of legacied into a couple of shows like the Animaniacs uh, reboot and and Disenchantment. But I'm right now, and I'm not worried about it because, no. like I said, I read for a year at the beginning of my career without getting you know a single job, and then boom, all of a sudden something comes through. I know something will come something will come through again. But I I I put I do put my best foot forward. And, and and it's you know to say knock out of the park. I tr- I do my I just do my best. I try not to worry about the result per se. I just go. Am I going to make this casting director laugh? Am I going to make the producer laugh? And am I going to? And I'm much better in a room, by the way. So that's part of the thing with COVID is I'm not seeing if what I'm doing is tickling anybody. You know, mm. I'm reading into a void. So. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad we're going to start getting back in studios. That's for sure. Yeah, well, your stand-up instincts 
and your comic instincts are, are brilliant. And stand up where you you kind of fed on the audience reaction. Uh, and you do get that in the booth when you've got a good number of people listening. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. My my goal was to make Andrea and you and the, our late friend Gordon Bressack, if he was in the booth, if it was one of his scripts, to just watch you, even if it was through a pane of glass. Well, look, yeah. I'm a mime all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, and I can't hear the sound. I can see that you guys are reacting to it. And I go, okay, I'm on the right track here. You know, so that 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 was always a, a thing with me, you know. Absolutely. And my, you're right. My stand-up instincts have served me well in that regard. Tom. Yes, thank yeah. you. Well, certainly your celebrity impressions, I know. Is that is that one of your jumping points for a lot of your, your characters? I know when I, for example, watching episodes of Hysteria or, or things like that where it's, it's you know, this is George Washington, but it's Bob Hope. Yeah. Hey, and that's something. <laughs> hey, I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> I love Hysteria, by the way. I, I, I There's the show that didn't get its due. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. it really, it should still be on the air. Uh, it's so many valuable lessons. I mean, I learned about history doing that show and presented it in, in such a fun way. The good news about it is, I guess, because it's it's evergreen, you know, I mean, yeah. we were, we we're going back in time, so we can't ever get dated, you know, whereas mm-hmm. on some those shows with political references, it's like. I think you did Carson on that show, maybe as Abe Lincoln. I did. I did. I did do. Uh, I did Johnny Carson as uh, Abraham Lincoln. Did you know that? Ed, did you know I do Abraham Lincoln? Uh, it's true. Uh, Very good. Beautiful. It, well, I which it reminds me. I kind of Tom. You you said when we had Mo on some at some point, we had to ask him about. Bob Hope at Starbucks or something. But this is this is <laughs> this is what Mo told me. I think Mo, did you experience this? This was yeah. This was this was uh, this was back during the original run. And of course, in California, in, in Los Angeles, and in show business, the reason that we heard so many jokes about Burbank, you don't learn this till you move here. All roads lead to Burbank. I mean, it's like it's this little hamlet. And yet everything happens here. And there's this Starbucks next to a restaurant called Bob's Big Boy, which is one of the original drive-in restaurants. And there's a Starbucks Starbucks that's adjoined to it. And uh, it's, a, you know, I was just sitting there having a cup of coffee after an Animaniac session. And I was working at the time on a little script that never went anywhere. But uh, I was, so I had my laptop and, and I, and I look up and into the handicap spot was this, this brand new, uh, uh, I think it was a Lincoln or a Cadillac. I'm not sure. And, you know, I paid it almost no heed, except that the gentleman was the younger gentleman who got out. I was like, Hey, what's he doing in that handicap spot? You know? Right. And then he obviously he goes over to help an elderly gentleman and, and the elderly gentleman, he wasn't using the walker. He just gave him his arm. And the elder elderly gentleman was Bob Hope. And I was like, Holy crap, that's right. Bob Hope lives around the corner from here. He gets up and goes to a Starbucks like anybody else. I mean, you know, he owns half the valley, but he still has to leave his house (laughs) to go get a stuff. And he's walking up. And as he's walking up on the guy, uh, he goes, he goes, uh, I'll be home for Christmas. (laughs) It was nowhere near Christmas, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he was referencing how long it was taking him to shuffle to the door of the Starbucks, <laughs> and and so I just thought, oh my god, I gotta get, I gotta get close, I, I gotta hear, I gotta hear Bob Hope just be a guy in a line, you know, ordering something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I I go in and I'm right behind him, and he's going, it's Snickerdoodle time. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, I just, I, I went, Mr. Hope, I'm, I, I hope I'm not disturbing. I just want to, I just want to thank you for all your body of work. And, uh, you know, I'm a, at the time I was young and I said, I'm a, I'm a young actor, I do voiceovers and, and some stand up, and I just, you're a hero of mine. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you having, you having some success. I said, I'm doing all right. I'm on this show, Animaniacs and, uh, 
And and yeah, I'm doing okay, Mr. Hope. Thank you. I'll let you order. He goes, All right. Hey, hey, I'd love one of them there snickerdoodles. <laughs> yeah, right now I turn here for a snickerdoodle. Yeah, the, the wife lets me go to work with her. She gets everything when I go. And, <laughs> and that was that was my brush with Bob Hope, you know, and I just <laughs> I went back to my table and continued working on my script. I never went anywhere. And I watched him shuffle back to his car. Fabulous. <laughs> Only in Burbank. Only in Burbank. And all because of Tom Ruger. Rugs. Oh, why? That's not me. If that's you hadn't hired me, I wouldn't have been there for that. Oh, moment. please. But that's <laughs> that's so funny. Um anyway, we we've had a, a great run. We uh we had fun with uh, Tiny Tunes. Um uh Tunes was Dis- Tunes Disney. was there. I was yeah, I was I was honored to be on board for that one. You know. That was the and first had- with Steven, yeah. Yep, and and the one and he actually came. He was so it was so new to him that he came to a session. And wouldn't you know? Either my character wasn't in it or oh, whatever. No. And no. but he signed, and I still have it. I don't think I have it up. I'm not sure where it is, but he signed a, a model sheet of Dizzy Devil. And oh, was, good. Hey Mo, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> and and he signs Spielberg very, like you can't. It looks like he said it signs it's Spilly. Ah. Oh. Steven Spilly. So Mar- Andrea and I like, always called him Steven Spilly whenever we, we talked to him. Because I was like, so crestfallen. Everybody else got to meet him, and I didn't. Um, you ultimately got to meet him. I with, did ultimately. Yes, because he, yeah. he actually cared about the show and threw this giant party. Like, it wasn't just – he was very involved, wasn't he, Tom? On Tiny Tunes, definitely, yeah. 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 But he threw this gigantic party for Animaniacs on the lot. Oh, yeah. That was a great party. Fabulous uh, party. And uh, we all got to pose with him and and, uh, talk to him for – you know, the amazing thing about Stephen, and you interface with him obviously much more than I did, was what I found remarkable – remarkable (laughs) – see, you've got your thing that trips you up. Remarkable does it for me. Um. (laughs) Was that we he, he threw two parties two years apart, and at the second party, he resumed the conversation that we ah. were in the middle of at the first party. Like he never forgot. Still and trapped. Had, yeah, he, his brain he, is still trapped. Yeah, uh, and it was amazing. He had his facility with a hundred a uh, hundred people standing in very close quarters to get time with him. He had a way of making you feel for that the. the the minute that you had him, you were the only person there. And yep. that that's extraordinary to me that he's got that quality. They say Bill Clinton has that quality too. And that he plays the sax. Yeah, I heard, <laughs> I heard a rumor. <laughs> and while well, I paid tons of income tax. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have lots of different questions and, uh, and many from our, our listeners as well. But uh, Nathan Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, I guess uh, Kelly, ladies first. Let's go to you. And if, is there? Oh, well, he already talked about Steven Spielberg. You know, that's what I was asking about. <laughs> exactly. Your one um, question's gone. <laughs> <laughs> let me. Uh, oh, here's here's a good follow up. I think to the the one um, about meeting Steven. Uh, what is the sweetest, most touching story that you have regarding meeting one of your fans? And then also, I'm supposed to tell you, this is from Mich- Michiki, that he absolutely loves how much personality you imbue into brain. Rewatching the show has inspired him. Her. Think, her, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> has inspired her as an artist to create more than she ever has before. She loves Brain's character and the dynamic between him and Pinky and your performance of him, along with the brilliant work done by the writers and artists, put such a big smile on her face. Oh. Well, thank you. Michiki, is that is that Michiki or Michiki? I call her Mitch. <laughs> Mitch. Um, <laughs> it's a very, very kind uh, 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 compliment, and thank you very much. The most touching story, uh, because it stands out in my mind, so it's among the first stories, uh, be, and it's so, and so therefore it stands out in my mind. I should say, um, it was, I believe, Tampa Bay Comic Con. Um, and I was there, uh, doing, you know, I was with, I was, it was weird. It was a hybrid Rob Paulson and I were there, but so was the cast of Futurama along with David X Cohen, who David had never done a comic book convention before. 
And this, I remember being stopped on my way to my table by this young lady who told me that her mother had passed away while she was still in high school and that for a year, she and her father, you know, grieved obviously, but they, they were in such a, a loss from the, from, from, uh, you know, the, 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 the mom left such a, such a void in their lives that they couldn't really talk to each other. Mom was the one who was the life of the, of the household. And so they, they were, they would fix meals together. They would sit down to eat together, but there hardly a word passed between them. But at four o'clock when Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain came on and they were back to back shows, they sat down on the couch together and they laughed they were allowed to laugh and, and enjoy and, you know, and quote the show and all that. And then, and then, you know, they would kind of go back into themselves, but they said that the the show helped them with their grieving process and to connect with each other. And I said to her then, as I say, every time somebody thanks me for the impact the show has on them, but I mean, I was very moved by that because my, I, I've suffered a few losses in my time, uh, a couple of a couple of very sudden and tragic um, that I know what grief can do. And so I said to her then, though, I said, I thank you on behalf of the 187 people who work on Pinky and the Brain and Animaniacs, because it's not just it's not just the voice actors. We have tremendous writers. We have fabulous artists. We have we have a great music music team. Mm. And on behalf of all those people, thank you for telling us that we helped you. And that's and I say that every time because, you know, I. Yeah, actors, you know, yeah, we, we, we're we okay at our job. We breathe a little life into these characters, but it's everything. It's the whole thing. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of like the, 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 the gravy is getting to know that you actually helped somebody by being a, being a self-interested actor who was just hoping to take home a check to pay the mortgage. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not like this Dalai Lama like mission, but it's nice to know you did a little good. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Nathan, what do you have? Oh, I'm a, I, I want to ask about pinky in the brain. Yes. And, oh man. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yes, my yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just so great. I, I, I don't even know. The, There's... Yeah, oh, the French champagne has long been celebrated. <laughs> By the way, just, just to zero in a little bit of my, my memorabilia. Yes. Yeah, so they see... are the themselves yes we can see that that's a limited print right there you have a pinky brain and this right here as i drop everything (laughs) it looks like an abstract painting right now as we're moving what have i and what have i done this is this is oh now (laughs) you're back oh there we go all right so this up here there's Bart Simpson. Oh, oh yeah. No, no, that uh-huh. is that's from Enchantment. That disenchantment. Right disenchantment. That's dis- yeah. that's my character oddball from Disenchantment. But I'm really meaning I'm not very good at this. That that is a caricature of me, done by Rogerio. Oh yeah. Uh, who uh, he did that caricature of me on uh, the day that we recorded? Yes, always. And I'm in a suit. <laughs> because I had just come from Sam Kinison's funeral. Oh my god! Um, was a dear friend of mine, and uh, and the only thing that could have lifted my spirits. And actually, as he took that, I was I was quite sad. And as he mm-hmm. drew that, he was drawing me in my in a little bit of my, uh, you know, I was, I was just trying to bring up the energy so I could I could do the show. And then we stepped in, and and you guys had prepared yes always as the episode, which is a takeoff on. The famous Orson Welles outtake tape, uh, where he does the frozen peace commercial, uh, and and all of his ranting and and sniping. And you didn't Elvis know director. you didn't know that episode was that. Day. No idea, no yeah. idea. I saw the <laughs> did, words, and I was like, "Oh my god, what did you was, guys do?" But did did you use that as a warm up? Is that right? As to get into your Orson Welles voice? Is that right? Or yeah, I I I'd been doing it for years. Okay, and. It was very inconsiderate of me, but whenever there was a lull, <laughs> you know, because I had headphones on and I had a microphone and I, I was like, I would go, all right, let me see how much more I can make it sound like. And then on the mic and I just, 
you know, a remote farm in Lincolnshire <laughs> where Mrs. Buckley lives. Every July, peas grow there. <laughs> and then in my head, I'm going, well, they're not stopping me. I guess they're still working on something technical. So let me just keep working on this. And I would do it for five minutes. And I didn't know why nobody was stopping me. And they didn't know why I was doing it. But somehow or another, we all seem to enjoy it. And it became like my little one man show. Oh, yeah. That, and and you know, that you, 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 went, you clearly went to the trouble of memorizing every syllable <laughs> and every moment of cadence in it. It's just, you know what? Yeah, it, I really did. I think I, it was almost this, this, uh, this obsessive thing. I had it on cassette back when cars had cassette players. <laughs> And, and I would just, I, it was a little, t somebody just dubbed it off on a professional, you know, like air check setup so that it was just that it was just the, you know, the, the, the two minutes and 37 seconds of it. So I would just hit rewind and I just kept listening to it. Like, was he getting away with this? This is awful. And yet it's delightful at the same time. <laughs> and so I would, I would just listen to my car. I would, I didn't listen to music for a year. I just listened to this thing. And I'm saying, Move it around, and I have no more time because he really did. He had this role in his voice as he said it, this tremuloso thing that happened. And I was like, How does he do that? I said, Get me a jury and show me how you can say in July. And I'll, anyway, yeah, <laughs> you can't say the Something rest of this. The family <laughs> show, buy yeah. cheese or nice something. Is that the... I'll buy yeah, cheese great. with you or something. Like yeah, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so then that I came in and 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 uh. You guys have cleaned that up a little bit from the swears, and it it ended up lifting my spirits that day. <laughs> but uh, you wanted, I'm sorry. Oh, Nathan, yeah. What, here, did, what so, did you want to ask about? Um, so how have Pinky and the Brain changed your friendship with Rob Paulson? And how has your friendship impacted the way you were, uh, how they were written, I guess? so. I, you'd have to ask the writers how much we inform the okay. way they're written. Rob and I became I mean, Rob and I enjoyed each other from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, from I mean, I mean, you know, we met two. Sh we met on actually on Johnny Quest when he was playing Haji, mm -hmm. uh, which the New Adventures Johnny Quest, which I think was, I want to say, nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety, and I had recognized him because he was on some Canadian commercials, uh, and I was still you know, splitting my time between LA and Toronto. It's very much more, you know, so I recognized his face and, and, and we immediately began riffing in um, Python. Hmm. He dropped the hmm. Python reference or I did. And then the other one picked it up and was like playing <laughs> tennis. And we would just see how long we could carry on the argument sketch or the pet, the, 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 the dead, dead parrot, parrot sketch, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, the cheese shop, how many cheeses we could remember. <laughs> And it's like, you know, when you play tennis with somebody who's better than you, you bring your game up so that you're almost <laughs> as good as them. And, uh, you know, so so over the years, and then, you know, as Rob and I, as the show took off, we started doing these gallery signings. Because Rob, you know, Rob and I, I think socially, we have very different interests. He's a car guy. He's a golf guy. Um you know, he, we both dig music though. We did, we did gone to a couple concerts together. Um, but I mean, he's a hockey we, guy too. Hockey and he's a guy. hockey guy. These are yeah. all things that hold no interest for me. As far <laughs> as something I get into. And as long as it goes forward, when I press on the, on the accelerator, I'm fine with it. Great. You know, I'm not a, I, I don't care about cars. Golf is just a way for my wrists and my palms to hurt. I tried. Yeah. You know, I'm just not in hockey. I was born without the hockey game. I, my brother, great hockey player. My father almost turned pro. The only wow. help, he was he was five foot six. It was the only thing that held him back. Had he been two inches taller, they would have recruited him too. Because he used to play ice, you know, rink, uh, you know, not rink hockey, pond hockey with Al Arbor, who went on to be the the um, the, 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 the the captain and then the uh, 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 general manager of the New York Jets. Uh, the New York Rangers, excuse right, me. Right, um, Rangers, yeah. um, and uh, he played with the Mahovlich brothers, wow. Frank and Pete. I mean, he was from Timmins, yeah. Ontario, a little tiny town where they they recruited in the 1950s and 60s, in the 40s, you know, uh, all the time. It was like one of the coldest 
friggin' places in Canada. You know, you could play <laughs> hockey there 10 months out of the year. So naturally they got these little 10,000 hours of hockey to see. Yeah. So um, <laughs> and my dad, I remember the first time my dad put on skates uh, in front of me and, and, you know, he's teaching us to skate. And he just said, I'll, uh, I'm just going to do a couple of turns around the, around the rink. You know, we're like, you know, the snow, <laughs> the snowsuit kids. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he looks like an Olympic skater wow. whipping around people wow. and just circling them and going back. And, and I was like, my father has superpowers. Oh, my God. <laughs> How does he do this? You know, and why don't I have that superpower? Was I born under a yellow sun or not? You know? <laughs> well, anyway, but the, so, so, but the thing that bonds Rob and me is our love of comedy, our love of making each other laugh. And when we started going on these Warner Brothers gallery signings, thanks to the Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain, we began to, you know, just go downstairs in the hotel, have dinner together and open up about our lives. And we felt that we, you know, we found we have very similar philosophies about helping people and, and being kind and being good. And, and then when Rob called me that he had, you know, and, and informed me that he had throat cancer, Oh, um, mm. uh, you know, which was, thank God, long, you know, in, in, a, in a happy outcome, you yes. know, but I mean, he, and he, he talks at length about it and he's actually now the, uh, the spokesman for, for, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the head and neck, uh, ontological society. And he's the celebrity spokes, uh, spokesperson for that. Uh, and, you know, he, he goes around being encouraging and, and, uh, you know, talking in front of groups of doctors about his experience, um, you know, it's, it's much the way they do say in AA where, you know, that the, the, they, you know, they, they share their experience, strength and hope. So he talks to patients, he talks to doctors about this, but when he called me with that, I, I thought, I can't, I can't let, I can't let him go through this alone. And I'm not giving myself a pat on the back for this at all. I just, it just, it was one of those things where he told me, again, I'm going to be doing chemo and, and probably he said, when's your first chemo appointment? You know, and I just thought, I just can't let him sit there on a, on a drip with this stuff, making him sick. So I went down and, and, and we just spritzed and had fun and mm. cracked up the nurses and did the voices for the other patients. Wow. And, you know, wow. and so, and I, at the time I had a very, I had a gig that was taking uh, you know, a, a, a lot up a lot of my time. I had resolved I was going to go to everyone. I ended up only getting to go to half of them, but I made sure that I was there to, to cheer them up and to just be. And we had a we had a great old time. And um, you know, we had a great old time while he's got a you know IV drip, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. basically putting poison in the system to poison the cancer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, we we just that that really strengthened us because I just thought I I'm. I, I can't let him go through this by himself. So um, I love that. Story. Very good. Yeah, yeah and great. and we've and we've you know stayed fast friends ever since. We're 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 brothers now. I just don't play hockey when uh, <laughs> rest yeah. of the neighborhood kids to go out and play hockey. Eh? I, I love the uh, when, on the first day of recording. You're wearing you know you're wearing the pinky yeah, shirt. Yeah, I wore he's wearing my the pinky t-shirt like... and he wore his brain <laughs> like... t-shirt. And we didn't call each other up to say. Yeah, it just happened to. Let's do a little switcheroo. I just wanted to, because you know he was he was in he was still in recovery, and he was clear. But I was like my way of saying I'm supporting you, pal. And I wore the pinky t-shirt, and uh, and it was uh, it was very cool. Awesome. Fun. Well, yeah. we we had a couple of questions here about the the writing process and kind of how that ties in with your performances here. For maybe Tom can can answer this. Uh, one here from uh, one of our patrons. We have a Patreon. She she mentioning how much she loved uh, how the the spinoff series gave more depth and nuanced uh, both in, uh, to Pinky and the Brain's relationship uh, and having some really emotionally potent episodes like a Pinky and Brain Christmas, uh, Welcome to the Jungle, This Old Mouse. Uh, Many, many other ones. So her question for you is, what made you and the writing staff, t uh, Tom, decide to give more dimension to those characters and their relationship in that spinoff? Well, I'll, I'll give uh, a great deal of uh, attention and, and uh, I mean, to Peter Hastings. 
Peter Hastings uh, wrote and produced uh, the Pinky and the Brain Christmas, which I think is one of the most, definitely one of the most touching uh, Pinky and the Brain episodes and really, you know, works on all cylinders, every part of it. So uh, all credit to Peter Hastings and, uh, you know, uh, the team, the director, uh, Liz and, and Rusty. Uh, and yes, I mean, once... Pinky and the Brain left the sort of the, the shorts department in Animaniacs and became half hour stories. You do have a chance to explore their personalities deeper. And I think Mo and Rob would be the first to say that they learned probably more about Pinky and the Brain in those half hours uh, than they knew from the shorts. Uh, and but then, you know, Peter did a, a bunch of great ones. Uh, Charlie Howell, Gordon Bressack came in, uh, Earl Crest. They did a bunch of great ones, including ones mentioned in, in the question. And uh, I think Rob and Mo are making new Pinky in the Branch. I think they're probably still learning little new things about their personalities. I mean, there's there's incredible subtlety to the performances of Rob and Mo. And while there's a lot written on the page, and you know, there's jokes written on the page, Rob and Mo bring a lot of sophistication in their performances that sort of make the humor work and, and make the audience know that these are real characters that are living and breathing. I will say, you know, when, when, uh, when we start, you know, I, I was, you know, we were the, we, as you said, we were shorts, we were 10 minutes long. We were, you know, it was nice to, you know, it was just mo more about, you know, the plan and how we're going to mess it up and come back to the lab. That thing I say at the end of the episode, back to the lab, prepare for the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, it, it was, it was, you know, you had to go a little deeper going into the half hour thing. And I think the the one we did where we were in medieval England, that was like sort of test footage, wasn't it? Because yeah. we mm. took up the entire episode. I was mm -hmm. amazed when we were handed this script and we got, it was all 26 pages was us. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, my God, are we going to be able to carry a half hour? With Pinky but, singing like the balladeer the whole time, annoying the daylights out of you as he's singing, yeah. narrating. Yes. Well, that's that's, you know, it's funny. Uh, I just to, to bring in uh, an anecdote from another show. Uh, but it's, <laughs> just the other day we were we were, you know, putting the finishing touches on a disenchantment. And Matt Groening was he said, you know, my friend just pointed something out to me that I never really noticed before. This show is about people who are really irritated with each other. And it's true. <laughs> Irritation is, and we're talking about this in Shaman, and I think all my characters that I'm on are irritated. I play irritation really well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wait, we lost we, you. Lost we you lost there, you, I don't want to say it too loud. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I tend towards irritation. Let's put it that way. I've, for instance, I have two massive dogs that knock, uh, you know, knock me over. And, and, you know, they're, they're, they're Dino from the Flintstones times two. And, and, you know, I, I just, you know, that's, it's just, I cats that trail things behind them. And yeah, anyway, the long and short of this irritation is a note I play really well. So, so, I think the writers may have latched, latched <laughs> onto that. I don't know. But yeah, it's really true of Pinky and the Brain. It's about Brain is irritated with Pinky, and Pinky just really loves Brain and wants to help, which irritates the hell out of Brain, <laughs> who really right. loves Pinky. That's right. That's mm -hmm. the thing, too, is that the show, you had to go deeper and you had to explore the love between these two characters. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, if you don't have love in a show, people don't want to stick with it. Absolutely. So, so we had to we had to have that, and you know, in in the reboot, uh, there are different ways. I can't, you know, there's a lot I can't say because of NDA. There are different ways that we explore that. I also know that the reboot, some people have found it darker, and I think uh, I, I I I can kind of I can absolutely understand saying that, and there were. There was a time where I had a little resistance to it myself, but I, I see also that, you know, after 20 years of not being able to take over the world, brain would get a little pissed off. So, 
So I think I think brain as he is now in the reboot is appropriate for that much failure. Oh yeah, that's sad. I'm sorry for brain's failure. Yeah, brain has yeah. never taken over the world in 22 years. Oh, that's sad. how much irrit- more irritated. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, let's go to, back to the listener question here, real quick. This is uh, one of our, another one of our, another one of our patrons, uh, the cartoon gamer. He goes by the cartoon gamer, and he wanted to know if there was any kind of standout moments uh, for the production of the old show or the new show. Things that just kind of really kind of he says an eye opener. It's been an eye opener. Define that as you, you will. Know if there's been any eye openers, yes, something yeah. that opens your eyes, and you said, oh. My, my yeah, my eyes are constantly being open to the possibilities of 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 you know what you can do with two characters. Um, you know, it's just like, it's 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 the smart one and and the and the slightly less smart one, or or as Peter Cook and Dudley Moore used to call it, the uninformed idiot and the informed idiot. <laughs> um, that's good. That's good. I mean, brain. You know, in his for all his intelligence, he's not smart enough to figure out that a two inch tall lab mouse. Is never going to be able to take over the world, but you know, um, you know, it's just to me. I'm always fascinated by the comic possibilities of these two characters, and that's that's eye opening. And of course, it's also made me realize how hard writing is because occasionally I've taken a whack at like, did I come up with a pinky in the brain story? I can like, it's like all the plots have been done, and I. Like we explored the, how much they know. We've done that. We've explored what they'd sacrifice for each other. And it's like it's just eye opening how hard writing is. You, well, know? <laughs> you almost you almost did a live action Pinky in the Brain movie with. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what from Kirk Tingblad said that he they had yeah, written Kirk, a script. Yep, and it was yep. it was Pinky in the Brain, uh, and I believe they turn into humans. And those and humans were going by to be us. Exactly. Played by Yeah, I mean, you. it was a treatment. I don't know how far they got with it. It was, but, but, uh, it was, it was, they, they'd gone out and written the entire script, which, um, you know, which is not really, you know, something that that shows their dedication because most people will wait for a little money to do that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, it was, it was an interesting idea, but I, I found myself going, people aren't going to watch Rob and me on, t- uh, you know, in the, uh, on the screen, they'll want Pinky in the brain. I'm hoping one day that somebody somewhere, including Stephen, of course, says, "Let's do a big, you know, yeah. big expensive Pinky in the brain film. We can take mm. these characters on the most incredible in in complex plot to take over the world. But you know, maybe they, 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 they. I don't know. Maybe they end up being the heroes. They save the world. I don't know. But I mean, it seems to me if you could do that with you know, the Muppets, sure. and Tom and Jerry, uh, you could do it with Pinky in the Brain. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a cinematic I think in story a, in, a, told. in a live action world with, where a really well animated sort of CGI Pinky in the Brain, you know, where you it sends the fur on them and everything. That could be, I think that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, now in, in that, in that movie, in my head that I, you know, cooked up, but never written down, I've always thought the scientists could be played by Rob and me, you know, uh, mm. and, the, you know, and maybe we, you know, <clears throat> stick a little something in our brains, pull a little bit of brain Ingram out and oh. inject the mice with it, you know, and that, that could be fun. That so is, that that's a I, good idea. I talked like that in the beginning, you know, I, I actually am Dr. LaMarche and I, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, and, uh, and, and Rob's the janitor, you know, the cockney janitor. <laughs> the world. No. Rob would get in here and I take, you know, and I, I just, you know, experiment with the two mice and they become pinky in the brain. That's my little thing. And by the way, don't steal it. Yes. Steven. That's great. I think, Pay me I for think it, Steven, pending. if you decide to use it. <laughs> he's 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 already written down the idea and mailed it to himself, so no one yeah, else can do works. it. <laughs> That's how it works, right? You can uh, write Pinky in the Brain scripts. I, I really do. I stole from every Pinky in the Brain script for those answers, John. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I know where my talents lie. I'm an interpreter like Sinatra. <laughs> yes, I'm a writer like Sammy Khan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so wait. Yes. There he wait, goes. Thank you very much. Same, except I have a different voice. <laughs> I, have, I have a far less interesting oh, voice right now. Welcome back, Mo. You missed Brain. Yeah, I don't know. What... <laughs> oh, really? He was here? He was here. Oh, was oh my. I've always wanted to meet him. Oh. <laughs> I, I think we better uh, shoot through some uh, questions uh, regarding the reboot because people are constantly emailing us to ask you these. And we'll just kind of shoot through them real quick because I don't think you're going to be able to answer many of these things. Yeah, I've got to say, I'm so. not, I, first of all, I'm not privy to much. You know, I yes. get the script that they, that they, I walk into the COVID clean studio and then led there and, you know, sit there with my mask and take it off once the person, and then that's it. So I don't, I don't, I'm not as involved, uh, you know, in the creative process as people might think. But well, anyway, yes. The, yeah, the, we'll the, get your no comments. And exactly. Your, <laughs> yeah, there are things that because I have non-disclosure agreements. Like yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. We don't want to get, yeah. we don't, we, we want Maurice to do the voice of the brain, ladies and gentlemen. We don't want to get, you yes. know, get exactly. him fired. Always. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> for, number one question is always, do you have any idea when the second season might premiere? I don't. I really don't. Um, uh, I, hopefully, it'll be sometime later this year. Uh, but we haven't been given, uh, or I haven't been told a date yet by uh, the net, the. Uh, ooh, did I almost give the wrong streaming service? The Hulu powers that be. So no, I don't. I don't know. But yes, it is coming. It yes, is coming. and that's what I always say. But they they never they never listen. Uh, it's coming this year. We think we're pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so are you still recording over zoom or are you starting to do the episodes again in person? Uh, we, as soon as studios were declared, you know, so it's the, the, as soon as there were protocols declared for, uh, for, uh, COVID, uh, and we start, we did start going back into studios. Just, we like the sound quality better. Rob and I are in the same kind of room. In the, there, there's a couple of episodes where we recorded in our home studios and I do hear, I do hear a difference. So, um, you know, they got us back into, you know, and we're never in the same room, but we are recording with each other and, and like in different parts of the building. So we're getting mm -hmm. that, we're getting that kind of professional so, sound quality. Well, that, that is good. That, Cause we yeah. did notice it every we're, now and we're then. best when we can play off of each other. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, some some people think that Squit might be returning for the reboot based off of some comments that Rob made in an online interview. I think he just said that you're the voice of Squit, but uh, but we've already kind of seen that you know the Good Feathers haven't really had any role in the the reboot. Uh, can you confirm that Squit is not coming back? As far as you, know? I can say that I can only say I have not recorded any Squit lines. Whether okay. he appears in the background in a blackout or anything like that. Or Someone else could do feathers. the voice. And <laughs> I hope yeah, I, well, I don't think they'd bother with that unless they got Ray, you know, Leota himself to do it. But no, I have not seen any evidence that, uh, that uh, now there are, there, there is descriptions, action descriptions, but I sort of go, Oh, that's not my lines for that. Yeah. And then I just read my lines, you know, so, <laughs> So I, I've, I've seen no evidence that the good feathers are showing up. All righty. All right. Um, I really don't know if there's any other questions that we could really to ask. Uh, Kelly, Nathan, do you look, you see, you'd see that list. I don't know if there's any really um, questions. And Animaniacs in concert, you guys sang a song. That's true. You guys did. Or sing. you did a, a whole Alvin and Costello kind of turkey. Yes. And is both anything written, like that going to be? written by, by <laughs> Randy Rogel. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, both, both the, uh, the brain song he, he gave me in my own little, uh, which which does incorporate the chord progressions of the, you know, the original song. But but I I talk sing through it's like over the world the time has come, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's how, and that's a wonderful little talk singing Rex Harrison -y thing that I can do. That's something that the writers I think might have lifted not lifted but employed from my life. I always kind of struggled with the singing, and they did an entire <laughs> episode called Brainatra. Where the through line of it is, brain can't keep saying, "I can't sing, I don't sing." I my pathetic warblings, and I'm like, "This is hitting a little close to home." <laughs> and yet, I had to sing as I had to sing Sinatra parody songs, which I do love. I, I, I when I was a kid, I used to go to my dad's apartment when my parents first divorced, 
And even if he wasn't there, you know, I had a key that could go there after school or something like that. And I would just, he had this like space age, you know, domed uh, stereo. And Sinatra, the sands were perpetually on the turntable. Uh-huh. So I just put it on and I just stand there and it's, I'm, I'm like 12 years old, 11 years old. Like, Weather wise, it's such a lovely day. But imagine that <laughs> all set up. Um, so yeah, so I think that was, that was fun. Um, but uh, the Animaniacs in concert, it, it is kind of fun to be able to do both those, the, both that wonderful, um, you know, uh, when we, it's turkey. It's, it first starts out with a yeah. of turkey. You- and Pinky, Pinky thinks I'm talking about lunch <laughs> or evening snack, depending on when the concert. And he's also suggesting about. other, like, gre- like other great, like, yeah, uh, chili yeah. and, it's, and things like that. You're like, oh, and then you're like, thinking he's talking about. Yeah, and I think he's talking about. Countries. Yeah, so, and it plays just like an Abbott and Costello who's on first routine. So those routines are really so. Could we possibly see those routines that are in Animaniacs in concert might be on the uh, the reboot in the future, or is that just staying to the Animaniacs in concerts? You know what? Just for funsies, one day we we did sit we did sit at, sit at our mics, and because we had the stuff memorized, we we kind of you know just performed it for uh, Wellesley and a couple of the uh, a couple of the other writers, and they loved it. And then never said another word about it. Ah, so we, as we said, you know, this could make a great, you know, this could make a great uh, episode, you know, or a little blackout or whatever. And, you know, who I knows? Mean, yes, always started off kind of like, you know, so yeah. <laughs> you know, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Something could happen. Um, are you, do you have plans to return to a uh, and main X and concerts in the future? As, as they... I think Rob and Randy have got a few dates lined up and then I know they want me on a couple of the, on a couple of them. I can't go on all of them only because some of their smaller venues and it just doesn't support three performers and the expenses involved in that. Mm-hmm. But I think I'm, there's at least two coming up in the next year. Mm-hmm. Again, as we begin to recover from, from, uh, you know, uh, from from the pandemic and get back to normal life. Uh, there's a, there's at least two that I know I'd be going on, and I think they're going to be at least partial orchestra show. Fantastic! So yeah, fantastic. Uh, well, and of course, there's there's Fan X coming up as well pretty soon, which hopefully you know some people will be able to go out there and see Maurice and I think Jess and Listen, Tress Indie and Pop. Robin. Indie Pop Con is coming up. Oh, Indie Pop is, as well. So there's July. The In cons July. are starting up again. In July. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if things keep going the way they're going, I think I'll be at that one. Excellent. Uh, with Rob, and so that'll be fun. Well, before we wrap things up, I think we better get to any uh, final questions here from Nathan Kelly. Anything that you saw on our little sheet that you you're like, we got to get this down. What? What? Anything from you, Kelly, at all? No, I think uh, we really touched on um, the majority of everything that, that was on the sheet. Rugs, you must have told the story of, of coming up with Pinky in the Brain by with yes you know, uh, the dynamic of. Of, of of Eddie Fitzgerald and and uh, Tom Mitten and uh, and then <laughs> it was it was sort of written with their personalities in mind and yet when uh, you arrived at the audition session and just started reading the copy going from your normal warm up of your Orson Welles commercial <laughs> just directly into the copy it was like it was, it was literally like. Well, what have we been thinking? Of course, this is the voice. Yeah. yeah. I just thought, you know, if I'd have met Minton before, I'd never met the man before Animaniacs. I wasn't on anything that he wrote over at Anna Barbera. If I knew Minton and did he, it, it, like Egon and right. only having the idea of Harold Ramis, I might have gone in there going, oh, yeah, look, they've drawn Minton. I better do my, uh, my Minton version there. I think you're funny <laughs> what I'm wondering. And because Tom talks, He's a very interesting guy, very smart guy. Funny he knows guy a lot too. of esoteric knowledge and very funny in the driest possible way. Yeah. But I would have done my Minton impression and then they would have been looking for three more weeks for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, their dynamic was, and this is, this is what great writing is, taking your life yeah. and elements from it and going, yeah. all right, let me work this in. And okay, the genius of Tom Ruger was he looked at these two guys who really had no business hanging out together. I mean, <laughs> well, Eddie Fitzgerald is an extremely energetic man. 
but he's not Cockney. Uh, you know, he's and they knew British. each other. Those two guys knew each other from filmation days, another studio. Right. And exactly. Mitten was literally in the next office for me at that time. And and all you'd ever hear over there was like, mm, 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 mm. I mean, you didn't hear much because he didn't talk a lot. But then, so I hear them, mm, 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 and then I hear like, oh, <laughs> Nerf, that's hilarious, Tom. Look. And, yeah. and I said, oh, my golly, what are they doing there? I think they're trying to take my job. They're trying to take over the studio. No. And it went on from there. Yeah. Genius. Just Inspiration. I didn't meet Eddie for like two years after we started Animaniacs. And and I was just astounded with the man's energy and how enthusiastic oh, yeah. he was. And he is so, a cartoon character as a human yeah, being. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Well, I... Mo, it's been fantastic having you on with us uh, once again. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. And, and really, I mean, you're just a legend in the biz. Awesome. And just, you know, Very like, kind. well, you, you truly are. But you, you helped influence and you just had a part in all of our lives. And uh, just thank you so much for, for coming again, on I, here. I, I, I just all I all I can say is I've been a very lucky working actor. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that I got to have any kind of positive influence on your childhood. So thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, and and for those of you who haven't seen Disenchantment, uh, Mo's performance and that Mo and Tress, I think, especially in the the latest season that that was released, I was just turn, I would turn to my wife and go, "Man, these two are good." <laughs> like just listen to your performances, uh, and multiple we both characters. Know, Tress and I both know we've discussed this. How lucky we've been to have been on shows with terrific writing. You know, for all that you know, the animation is visual and colorful. The writing in Animaniacs, Pinky in the Brain, uh, Tiny Toons, and and Ghostbusters, which you know had Joe met, uh, Joe Joe uh, Joe Straczynski, who went on to create Babylon Five, was our story editor on that. And we had some phenomenal writers on that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Futurama, The Critic, and Disenchantment. We're so lucky to work with great writers, mm-hmm. and I include you in that, Tom. Absolutely, at the very top of the list. I mean, it's just you've created characters that are so memorable in in all those shows, and and, and so you know, it's half the work is is being lucky enough to get cast in something so well written. So we 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 know that we honor that. Thank and, you. And all of us are lucky that uh, we had you in the cast. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get to some contact information. Uh, let's let's start with the small potatoes, Nathan. Where can people yeah. find you on Twitter? Oh, Joey, I'm on uh, Twitter. Yeah, Jingo FD, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Kelly, what about you? I'm also on Twitter, Yoda Princess, Y O D A, P R N C S S, or email me, Kelly, at bigshinyrobot.com. All right. And Mr. Tom Ruger, how can I'm, people find you all online and stuff? I, I, I have no idea. No, <laughs> I, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. It's just, uh, it's uh, just, cornucopia of of media so good luck in finding that all righty and mo how about you where can people find you to follow you and bug you with all these questions you can't answer about the new reboot and stuff (laughs) (laughs) i am on twitter uh as at maurice lamarche all one word m-a-u-r-i-c-e-l-m-a-r-c-h-e on instagram where i post very rarely because i don't know that people really want to see a lot of pictures of me an aging uh, obese man. Uh, you know, the, the, the great thing about me is my is my voices, which doesn't come through on it on Instagram. You know, I do have I do still have my hair. That is maybe the most impressive thing about me in terms of my physicality. I'm told I have nice eyes, but other than that, uh, you can see my, my limited Instagram contributions at at Maurice underscore Lamarche. So M A U R I C E underscore L A M A R C H E. And you know, if you can find me on Facebook, you know, I've got, I've got, uh, got a Facebook account too. Maybe you'll <laughs> well, that will do it for today's episode of the Animani Cast. So, for Nathan, Kelly, Tom, and Mo, this is Joey saying good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Hey, good night, everybody. Grrr. <laughs> <laughs> 
This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, Tiny Toon Adventures, Freakazoid, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacast unless otherwise indicated. Brain, you're here. Great. And only 45 minutes late today. You leave. But, Brain, I'm the producer. Then leave very quickly. (laughs) 